Welcome to Ask the Dentist. I'm here again. Uh, I think now this is the fourth time with my friend and a wonderful, incredible, very knowledgeable pediatric dentist, Dr. Stacy Whitman, otherwise known as Dr. Stacy. Uh, and we're going to dive deep and really kind of get into a topic that I'm very fond of and I think is probably one of the most important topics in dentistry, and that is your, your child's first dental visit and how they perceive um, uh, dentistry from that point on, because I've seen it in the adults that I see, the phobic adults, it determines so much and, and not just their dental destiny, their oral health, but their overall health de destiny, because they are, they've been so traumatized as a child, just with one visit perhaps, um, or, or one visit and then the lack of visits because of that one visit, that they end up with a lot of systemic issues uh, because we know that there is this oral systemic connection. So, so again, thank you, Stacy, Dr. Stacy, for being back. And uh, I know you have a lot to say about this. Um, we're going to talk about how you you can prepare, how you should prepare your child for the first dental appointment. Um, uh, what if your child is already afraid of a dentist? Where does that come from? That's a question I have. I've seen that happen, um, and I think we know the answer. But we'll talk about that and what to do with the kid who won't open their mouth at the dentist. Uh, again, that's why we have Dr. Stacy here. She is actually trained to deal with that one specific issue. Um, we're also gonna talk about dental anxiety, how, how common it is, and mm -hmm. how there are some techniques that you probably have not heard about that can build this healthy relationship for the rest of that person's life between the dentist and something that will carry on into adulthood. So again, Dr. Stacy is a board certified pediatric dentist uh, and a mom herself, two kids. And so Dr. Stacy, tell me, for your children, how early did you start preparing them for that uh, first dental appointment? And that's probably not a fair question to ask you because you're a dentist and yeah. were, were you talking to them before they were born through the, in, to the womb saying, oh. don't worry. <laughs> well, they were at work <laughs> with me, so I guess they were exposed to it pretty early. Right. Um, well, they heard the drill, right? They, they heard, heard the drill, yes, yeah. I was wondering about that, right? I mean, they must. So yes. that's a good question. Uh, I mean, we, I think it starts with creating an oral hygiene routine mm -hmm. at home. So I started that, honestly, before their teeth erupted. Right. I was, you know, wiping their gums. Right. And Don't wait for the teeth. Exactly. No, no, stimulating their gums, getting in there. So they were used to that. I mean, we started brushing immediately. We started playing around with floss as soon as I could, whether there was space or no space. Um, so that desensitized them too. I have a couple of videos um, posted on my website and my um, Instagram channel too, showing that I, I like to lay kids back very often with our hygiene routine when they're babies. So very often I say changing table and that will help prep them for the dentist also because dentists, we do like to lay patients back. You can right. see down into their mouth a lot better and see what you're doing. And that's scary. I mean, it's like a trust fall, you know? So practicing that like upside down right. posture, I think can help. You know, we did read books. There's so many great dental books um, about brushing teeth. You know, I would start talking to them about it very early, how important it is to take good care of our teeth, not only with brushing and flossing, but also with what we're eating and what we're putting into our bodies. And right. I still, my girls are four and six, and we still talk about that. Um, it's not just about candy and soda. It's mm -hmm. much more involved than that. And I, I don't think it's ever too early to start talking about that because there is an oral systemic connection. Um, and the more educated and comfortable and excited children are about oral hygiene, I think it just sets them up for tremendous success into the future and into adulthood. Right. Yeah, it's, um, it is so important for that first visit to go well. Um, I sometimes think, I mean, I know that the Society of Pediatric Dentists, they recommend age one. That's for, um, I think that's for breastfeeding advice and bottle feeding advice and all that. General dentists typically say, oh, don't come in until their teeth, like age three. I think yeah. that's too late. It's way um, too late. But I, I always tell parents, you know, bring your, and parents will ask, which is a, it's a great question. 
um, I ask, I, I tell them when you have your next visit for a cleaning, bring your child in. Now the child could be two months old, it could be six months old, but at least the child sees mom or dad in the chair. They're, they're sitting in their crib, upright, hopefully watching, and they get a feel for the room and the smells. Uh, yeah. A lot of kids are set off by smells. Dental offices don't always smell great. I've heard that from people. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the ozonator works well there. But anyway, um, uh, and, and that way they see the parent lying down. They see someone crouching over them with a bright light and loops and and, and it goes on for an hour. And I think that that is a great way to go. Uh, back to that comment you made about the changing table, winding the kid down. What I've noticed is that if the child has a gag reflex mm -hmm. and you lay them down and then you come in above them and hover over them and put things in their mouth and block their airway, they, that's a panic moment for them. Yeah. Because they only have one airway to breathe through. They can't breathe through their nose because they're congested or you know, um, a congenital defect, deviated septum, allergies. Uh, so a lot of the time I will sit the kid up um, and do the exam. That's hard on us, of course, but at least it creates that first win, like the child opened their mm -hmm. mouth. Uh, I love giving the child a mirror uh, so that they can see with, with, with yeah. the light on, well, on our loops. It's so handy because it's not blocked from above. They're mm -hmm. holding a mirror and you can just show them things that they've never seen before. Uh, tell them to wiggle their tongue and show them the back of their throat and some teeth, have them count. Um, if mom or, well, when mom or dad are there, I have them in the chair with the child on top of them. Or if the child's old enough, we have plastic mirrors. Yep. I wouldn't do this with a metal mirror. I will have the child walk over, you know, they're short and they can walk over and their head is right at the level of the parent's head. And I will have them put a mirror. I'll provide the light with my loops. I will have them put um, that plastic mirror inside mom's mouth. Yeah. It's amazing what they're seeing. And all of a sudden they become very distracted through the notion that this is fascinating. This is like Ooh. something I've never seen before. So, yeah. so there are all these tricks. Um, what, um, let, let's talk a little bit about, um, so how soon do you want to see the kids? Let's, let's get that out of the way. That's well, important. I, those are really good points, by the way. And so we, I, I, through experience, have learned to read the child the moment I work in, walk in the room. So that being said, if a child is uncomfortable laying back, we have, a, we have beanbag chairs and things that we'll lay down next to them. Or we will just consider it a dress rehearsal and we send them home with a bag with gloves and a plastic mirror. Nice. So they can start desensitizing. So there's so many tricks, right? So, um, so that is true. It's not, we're all bio individuals. So everything's different, right. but I like to see, to answer your question. I mean, yes, the gold standard answer is by the first tooth erupting or by the age of one, most parents I see bring their children in at one. I consider that a win compared to how it used to be when it was three or five. Which honestly is way too late. I mean, rampant cavities can be noted right. at that age. Plus, they already have a fear of the dentist. Right. At that point. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of, I get this a lot. Parents don't know, babe, you can get a cavity the minute your tooth erupts. Yeah. I see cavities in 10 month olds. Right. I know it's shocking, but right. it's true. It's sad and it's true. So I would say around one, but I would, I mean, even earlier, I do, I'm starting to see more eight and 10 month olds now. Mm -hmm. A lot of times too, the parents are coming to me because I am a functional dentist. They're, they're wanting me to assess their lip and tongue, their freedoms, right. whether they have ties or not, or a restriction. Um, Cause maybe they got through breastfeeding. It was okay. But now the child's mouth breathing or has low tongue posture. Mm -hmm they're they're more aware that that can be an issue if it's untreated and it's often better to try to treat younger than older so they're coming to me earlier and earlier but um right. i would say as close to the first birthday as you can and then also if you have two children you know your older child is already going to the dentist bring the younger child in as well like you mentioned just for exposure the right. baby um i know covid has different rules now but you know, there's even YouTube videos and things. Um, I'm gonna have videos soon on my website, kind of showing what it will look like as to, I mean, just exposure, right. however much you can, can really help. And knowing 
you know, not to push things too much. Cause again, that, that first appointment is important to have a positive experience. Right. Will there maybe be some tears? Maybe. maybe it depends how much the parents want me to look. You know, sometimes the parents come in with, with legitimate concerns. I think I see a cavity up here. Right. And then the child I can tell is not going to let me look very easily. So then I ask the parent, what is your comfort level? And they will say, I'm fine. Let's lay them back. It's very quick. Mm -hmm. In and out, you know, and then we just try to create a, like, you know, positive reinforcement, right. make sure they still leave happy. Um, but, but creating a fun routine at home you know, singing songs, chasing animals, making brushing fun, that can help at the dentist too. It's really important. Um, I think uh, I've seen your practice. I've seen photos of it. I've seen your team. Uh, I think it really helps when the child's walking into a colorfully painted home. I mean, you practice out of a home um, yeah. with uh, different rooms and, and uh, fun stuff. I mean, when I see a child, I mean, my, my practice is geared more towards adults. And I think that sometimes is not a good thing for a child. So talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, how your practice looks and feels differently and why that could be very important because I think there's some children that should not see a general dentist. They should automatically, the parent should know to take them to a pedodontist. How would that parent know by what's happening at home to make that decision? Well, if you have a really happy-go-lucky kid that's, you know, do, doesn't battle you with brushing and, I, I mean, I think you can always try with your family dentist and see how it goes. Um, I will say most dental offices are a bit sterile, you know, and kids pick up on that. You know, environment is so huge to all of us. Right. And I'm a big feng shui believer. Um, and I just helped design the office with that in mind. So there's a lot of bright colors. There's a ton of natural light and air and openness. And it's very kid friendly, but it's also comfortable for parents. We didn't make it, you know, over the top with Disney stuff, but it's bright colors and we have fruits and veggies everywhere and rainbows and my team too are just kids at heart. That really helps. It does. It helps to know how to speak to a child and to show them what you're doing and to earn trust mm -hmm. and not to force things. I mean, these are human beings, you know, and autonomy is important. And, you know, when you're in, it's just what you said, when you're in someone's oral cavity, it's very intimidating. Um, especially if they can't see what they're doing, you don't know what the, I mean, you fear for the worst. You don't know what the other person's going to do to you. So I think we expect a lot out of kids at the dental office. I mean, I really think they do a great job overall considering what we're doing. So, um, yeah, I mean, the office, it, we have an elevator. I mean, we just try to make it so fun. There's prizes and, you know, all. Yeah, I think all that's very important. I think uh, most children, even though they may seem to do well, I think it's very stressful for them to go to a regular dental office. Uh, I know a lot of dentists will be upset when I say that, but again, this is a kid. This is not just any patient and there is a big difference. And I think it's time that we really consider kids to be much different. Um, I mean, if, it's also the first visit. Uh, um, what about parents? Do you allow them in the operatory? I mean, allow is not the word, but do you recommend that they are in the operatory or not? I know this is a big issue. A lot of parents are upset when they're told to stay in the waiting room, that it's better for the child. Or And, and I know it's on a case-by-case case, uh, case by case basis, but what's your thinking on that? How does that, how does that help the, the child if the parent's not there? Well, whew, that's a tough question. It so is. we talk about it a lot in the beginning mm -hmm. before at the consult or the new first appointment. I, I generally do allow, allow parents in. I will be very honest. I prefer parents not to be there. And it's for so many reasons. I mean, the dental provider sometimes gets more nervous because they know you're watching us so closely and, Right. 
child me kind of swam one way and I know it was just from the water, but a mom who's, who's already nervous from her own dental trauma or a dad who had a bad experience, right. they can feed into that, you know, and jump up, not even meaning to and say, oh my gosh, are you in pain? Yeah. You know, the P word, I don't like the right. P word. That just sets, it puts that out into the universe. It can just really go downhill quickly. Yep. We have signs around the office uh, talking about emotional energy mm -hmm. and how it's transferable. And sadly, I agree with you, so many adults have dental trauma and dental phobia. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's exactly the reason why I became a pediatric dentist is that I was, a, I was an adult dentist. I was a general dentist for a few years before I went back to get my specialty. And I just, it bummed me out how many people were terrified of me, right. <laughs> um, not even knowing me, you right. know, and I, I think right. I'm pretty friendly and like approachable, but they, right. it was, it, it was deep rooted from a childhood experience usually. And I just said, man, it does not need to be this way. Right. Um, so a lot of parents, you know, we do talk, like if you have dental fear or phobia, I need you to try to check that at the door or send them with another adult mm -hmm. or meditate or use calming oils or do yoga before. I mean, whatever you need to do, mm -hmm. but you know, you do need to trust that I treat, I'm treating our child like my child. Exactly. We, we go into pediatrics for a reason. I mean, mm -hmm. we are here to help kids, children. Right. right. And that's another reason why sometimes the general family dentist may not be the best fit is this takes a very special personality. Yes. It, it, it just, it's changes your flow, your workflow, you know, you have to spend longer. Um, it doesn't ever go as you expect, you know, mm -hmm. it, you, all, you, it's constantly changing your right. day. You never know what's going to happen with kids, right. right? They're unpredictable sometimes. Yep. So, um, so we just, we talk a lot about emotional energy, you know, we really do. And then some parents will say, you can see them shaking, um, just at the consult visit. And I just say, you know, it might be best for you to stay outside of the room. Um, and they get it. I think they yeah, do get it. And right. but we do set up where they can look through a window. Right. So the child thinks they're gone, but the, the parent they're there. Can be there. Right. Um, you know, but I do, I want it's hard for parents to be told they, they can't be with the yeah. child. I get that. You don't, right. you but I agree. I agree that the, the child's agree. relationship with you as the dentist is much different when the parent is not there. It's better. They're more attentive, but the minute the parent comes in and there's a little bit of anxiety, it is okay. It's normal for a child to right away. And, and you can see it. They look, well, they're listening for they their look parents. at the parent. They're going right. to, and that's the other thing we talk about it a lot that, you can be here, but I ask you're a silent observer. Yes. So really try to bite your tongue. Um, right. It will guide your child with my voice. Right. It's confusing if everyone's yelling yeah. Yeah. order right. for the child. Yeah. So, but I'm really lucky again. My parent population is so amazing yeah. that they're just on board. I mean, right. honestly, I can count yeah. on one hand in five yeah. years. Right. Times I've had it, can, it can be, I mean, at, at best case scenarios, the parent will lean over and touch their child's knee when you're about to do something and say, don't worry, honey, this won't hurt a bit. That's not what we want. Or, or it can get or, worse. You're it'll about to get a shot. Yes, exactly. Right. It's a needle. Don't worry. You know, it's uh, yeah, that's not the way to do it. But also, I mean, my next question is, uh, and it, it ties right into this, uh, there are some parents that will sit there and say, I told you, Johnny, that this is going to hurt a lot because you didn't, you ate too many cookies or, or Dang crackers. Me. So how does that, um, I know a lot of children come to the dentist. And of course, if you're wearing a white coat and it's all clinical and it looks like the doctor's office, which they've already had vaccinations, yeah, that's where a lot of it comes from. But there are a lot of kids that will come into an office like yours, which doesn't even look like a dental office. It looks like a fun place. It looks like a preschool or a gymboree. Yeah. And, but somehow they know that this is going to be a traumatic experience. Where does that come from? And how does the parent or the parents fit into that, that whole mechanism? I mean, I don't have the answer. I have theories. I mean, 
again, energy is transferable. So if the parent has had anxiety leading up to the appointment, kids can sense it in your tone, mm-hmm. the way you just are speaking about the appointment. I, you know, I don't know what you're saying to them on the car ride over. They right. might have an older sibling that's giving them a hard time. I mean, I, I always trust parents to know their child best, but I really think less information is better. And then knowing that we will, in our safe, gentle language, explain to the child what is happening in age-appropriate terms to, one, make them feel safe and comfortable, but also to get the treatment done, you know, Um, which is the end goal. Because, you know, we're trying to avoid, and some of these younger kids, we're trying to avoid anesthesia. Right. So it's really important to set them up for success. success. Right. Right. Um, And again, most parents are pretty respectful about it. I mean, if there's some shaming or guilt going on, I try to gently kind of stand up for the child and just, I I always like to keep it positive. We're entitled to make mistakes. Baby teeth fall out. You know, I'm here to fix them if needed. And then we start fresh and then we work together as a team to keep them cavity free. I don't like to shame a child. Um, So then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pump this child up in front of the parent gently if they're doing kind of some shaming and then I might speak to them to just say you know we're 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 all a team here you know Johnny we're, he's going to do great we're going to motivate him I have some ideas um here's some charts and a kind of like accountability things and um you know just try to keep it positive there's right. just so many emotions it's a lot yeah. oh yeah so, it's a tough one yeah. so ideally in an ideal world what can both parents do before that first visit to make sure that it's a success? And I know it's not just the night before, I'm talking about everything leading up to it, uh, how they approach oral hygiene, um, uh, how they talk about certain foods that may cause cavities, the whole thing, and that first visit, and overcoming or not mentioning their phobias or transferring their phobias. How should all that be dealt with? I know that's a big question, but- Yeah. I mean, first of all, just being aware of it. I mean, you just saying all those things, it's like, you know, to all the parents out there listening, please know these are things that we we see as issues sometimes, especially if you've had a bad experience. Really try to not mention that in front of your child. Right. Um, because I trust you. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I assure you, most pediatric dentists, your child's going to have a good experience. They really will. I mean, we're trained. Right. Things are different from my my dentist when I was a kid is very different than dentists today. The training's very different. Um, But, you know, keeping things positive at home with brushing and flossing, try not to force it, like not pinning them down. I do say it is a bit of a non-negotiable in my house, just Mm -hmm. like a seatbelt. But I do think there are ways that you can make it fun. You know, if your child doesn't like to lay back, if they gag a lot, like you mentioned, sit them up. Sit them in their high chair, brush their teeth in the high chair, do it in the bathtub, just kind of play around with it, make it a game, sing songs, put on a favorite song, chase animals. I'm not huge into screens in young children, but maybe they get five minutes of their favorite show that could be educational. Um, Use a a, a a happy tone, Mm -hmm. you know, I've worked with some IBCLCs and ENTs who talk about after phrenectomies doing your stretching exercises Mm -hmm. and how important the mood and tone of the parent is. So even dim the lights, put on some essential oils, you know, sing in a soft voice. Okay, now we're going to brush teeth, you know, whatever works for your child. Right. Um, Seems like a lot of work, but it is very, very important. Um, yeah, I always is. tell the parents to, as you said, keep it upbeat, tell jokes, dance a little bit. But I think the most important thing that I try and pass on is that the family that brushes and flosses together are the fa- cat are the families that get fewer cavities. And yeah. I don't know why that is. There's got to be a reason for it. But when the kid sees the parents doing the same thing, when a kid is told what to do and they don't see the parent doing it, that is a problem at any age. And so I always tell parents, brainwash your child by after dinner, just going into the bathroom, coming back with a dry toothbrush, no toothpaste, and just sit there in front of your kid and start brushing or flossing. Yeah. And or do that consistently. Them, let them brush and floss your teeth. Kids right. get 
kick, kick out of, out of that. Yep. You love it. And right. then maybe you're helping create a future dentist, which yes. we need. You know, we need, we need them. <laughs> so, you know, look on YouTube again. I, I'm making more and more videos as I can. Um, but it, I'll be honest, most kids do pretty well. They, they really do. do. And I, I, they are, and I, I contribute that to my team. I mean, you know, it, it's not only about the dentist, it is about their team. Right. You, you probably know you spend more time usually with the dental team or the dental yes. hygienist than you do with right. the, den the dentist. Right. So, um, and don't feel you have to go somewhere just because that's where your insurance says to go. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is healthcare. You want to set your whole family up for success. So it's okay mm -hmm. to get second opinions. It's okay to shop around, quote unquote, mm -hmm. to find a better fit. There's all different personalities and styles and office settings and you know, at the end of the day, it's what's right for your child and your family. And that's what matters. So, right. yeah. No, I agree. What about parents that ask you questions like, is nitrous safe? Or what about the, uh, some, I know a lot of pedodontists will pre-medicate the child. They'll have the parent fill a prescription <laughs> and, and then give them a pill and they carry the child in. I mean, how do you feel about that? Terribly. I, I mean, I'm almost, I don't do that. I've never done that. I would never do that. I don't think you're allowed to do that in Oregon. I think if you do right. administer any medication, it has to be in the dental office. Right. So some, some people do oral sedation. I'm not comfortable with it. I personally feel like it has opposite effects very often. It, it's called a paradoxical effect. It's a negative effect, right? It's a negative effect. Then you don't get your work done or it's a total rodeo. Mm. Sometimes the child still remembers it. Yes. And then the parent is traumatized because their your kid can just act un otherworldly. I mean, yep. it's not your child. Scary, exactly. To so, watch. Um, I do use nitrous okay. oxide. I don't think I could work if I didn't. I'll be very honest with you. It really helps. There are some parents who say, I don't feel comfortable using it. I respect that. Mm -hmm. Very often, it's a really rough procedure. It's right. stressful. My blood pressure physically goes up. I mean, I try to remain calm and do my box breathing right. and all of that while I'm right. working, but you, you should have the nitrous max mask on, I right? Not the child. <laughs> or just more oxygen. I don't know. Right, um, exactly. Yeah, but you I know think nitrous I, is fine. It's very inert. It's very short lasting. It's way better than premedicating or oral sedation. I'm not fond of oral sedation. Me neither. It, it makes it easier for the practitioner, but in the long run, it doesn't build that habit forming like I like the dentist, I'm gonna go back. Uh, and that's important. Um yeah. So nitrous is, uh, I'm okay with nitrous. I think it's I mean, it's, it's fine. used in Honestly, labor and delivery problem. now. I mean, women in, are using it in labor and delivery and right. avoiding exactly. the girls. I mean, that's yep. amazing. It is and amazing. And so just to quickly share, you know, nitrous helps with anxiety. Mm -hmm. It helps with time. So I might have an hour-long procedure or the yes. child's in the chair for an hour, but the child thinks they're there for 10 yes. minutes. It's an amnesic effect, which is wonderful. The amnesia effect it helps right. with gag reflex and it helps a little bit with pain so it's it's amazing yep. some parents are concerned with mthfr gene mutation mm -hmm. we go into great lengths about that very quick this is a whole other topic so i'll be very brief but um you want to be careful self-diagnosing your child with that just because you have it or maybe 23andMe said you do. The biggest thing I want to know is, is it homozygous or heterozygous? Right. Homozygous is pretty darn rare. Heterozygous, the biggest thing you can do, just supplement with leafy green vegetables and green smoothies um, a few days before, a few days after. We have an MTHFR protocol here prior before and after nitrous or, or using our anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. You can use Epsom salt baths after, bentonite clay baths. Um, but it is it is safe to use in, in children who have hetero, uh, heterozygous MTHFR. Right. But if you're worried and you're, you just think your child has it, you should get them tested. Yeah. I mean, 
let's let's get so many other reasons as well right oh absolutely let's just get a definitive diagnosis yes because honestly especially if your child's seven and under the dental dental appointments can be really hard without nitrous they they really can and then we've created trauma you know that's just not the goal so yeah I agree. I, I love talking about this topic. So in general, just to wrap things up, I think we've made some parents nervous, of course, just talking about it. They, you know, even though we've been trying to encourage them and have given them all sorts of great tips and what to do, I think uh, the whole thing just brings up a lot of bad memories. So, but that's the whole point. If we can just, parents know, I mean, I, I had a bad dental experience uh, my first time around and and. and all the patients that I see as adults that are nervous, I would say 99.9% of them can think back and remember that first dental visit. And I think that's the takeaway message is that whatever you do, it's just a, it's a one-time investment in that child, but make it a fantastic, positive experience. It's win-win and it determines so much. I mean, that bifurcation of, am I going to be at age one or at age six months, am I going to be a fearful patient of anyone dealing with oral health, your dentist, or will I be a good patient? And that determines so much. I mean, and, and, and I'm not just talking about oral health. I'm talking about diabetes and Alzheimer's and, and your stature in life in terms of uh, your socioeconomic uh, economic status, uh, what jobs you get, who you uh, interact with, who your partners are. I mean, teeth are that important. I hate to say that, but it's true. So you really wanna invest, again, to the parents, invest a lot of time, everything we talked about, invest that, make that investment uh, because it is so important. It is really a monumental kind of moment for the child and don't let them, you know, have that experience that you did. There's no excuse for it these days. Back in the old days, maybe. I mean, dentists, remember when, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, again, um, I'm quite a bit older than you are, but the, it, they taught me in dental school that the there's no pulpal pain on a deciduous tooth. Oh my God. Isn't that crazy? I mean, of course it has sensation. So, um, and my dentist, when I was 10, I remember very well, he would drill on my teeth. He'd give me a little nitrous, but no anesthesia. And uh, he would he would just go to town on fillings terrible. and and I would sit there and bear with it, but oh my God, it was so traumatic. It was so well, painful. That imprints upon, I mean, that, that mm-hmm. imprints upon you. I mean, right. I'm sure if there are therapists out there listening, <laughs> there, must be t- there must be dental discussions. Yeah. And oh more. yeah, definitely. There's millions yeah. of stories. Right. But I, I do like to say, I mean, almost all the kids I, at my office, I think, I really think they leave pretty happy. Yep. For those that are super nervous, ask your dentist if they have um happy visits or dress rehearsal visits we offer programs like that here Mm -hmm. so it's like a package we set up but you know for kids that are very very fearful for whatever reason we have like a series of five or seven however many you need so like the first visit you come in and maybe you just take a tour and you leave Mm -hmm. with a prize and the next time you come in and you take a ride in the chair (laughs) and you leave and but you do them close together to establish trust and and they work. They really work. So talk to your dentist or dental provider to see if they would work with your family or something like that. Again, it's such, it's so worth the investment. Well, just Dr. Stacy, what you just said there at the beginning of that, it's uh, you said, and I, I know you're not bragging that all your kids have great experiences. This is why you should see a pediatric dentist like Dr. Stacy someone that's set up for it. Um, I think it's so important. It is, it is a monumental uh, kind of moment and you just got to get it right. So make it easy on yourself and go to a fun and happy place, right? Yeah. And, and uh, so again, let's wrap this up. Uh, we've gone on a little too long. We've probably made a lot of people nervous, um, but it's reassuring to know that a kid's first visit these days, at least, uh, can be Fantastic. I mean, 100% guaranteed. It can be a good experience. And again, that determines so much. Uh, having that healthy relationship with your dentist, uh, it determines so much. Their oral health and, and their systemic health for the rest of your life. So again, thanks for spending all that time today uh, talking yeah. about anxiety. And I, and I know we didn't cover it all, but, and I'd just like to say one thing, and maybe you can comment on it. It's, it's I think sometimes it's great if the parent comes in first. There are nervous parents that are nervous because they've had dental experiences. And, you know, why not just 
go see the dentist first. And if you feel comfortable, that's a great sign for your child. Why not, why not uh, consider that? And you, you, yeah. would be, you would be open to that, right? Oh yeah, parents have tours pretty right. often. We have kind of, we have summer parties every summer to give back to the community. And mm -hmm. we have open houses and things like that for parents to come in. Right. Yeah, swing by. Or what I tell my neighborhood kids too is, you know, if they were a little nervous, stop by, I'm just say stop by any time to just play in the waiting room. Now, again, because of coronavirus, it's a little different because there are no yeah. toys, but you can just walk through or just walk by the building and say hi and wave at the building. Right. It's just, again, creating that positive right. memory. I mean, check through their dentist if they're okay with that, but we, we are. We just ask you to tell the front desk that you don't have an appointment. You're just right. hanging out, but, exactly. and, and don't overthink it. We, I mean, we didn't mean to, to scare you, honestly, most pediatric dentists are very skilled and trained in creating right. a positive um, appointment. And to me, the experience is far more important than the teeth. It really is. I mean, yep. it, I probably shouldn't be saying that, but it's true. I just, yep. Yep. having a positive experience is right. critical. And, and I'd like to add one more thing, and that is, uh, you told me a while ago that sometimes you have a tough time getting rid of the kids like and the parents can't get them out of your office so that's a great sign they enjoy being there they like it they see it as a uh, as a comfortable secure place and i think that is the ultimate uh compliment to someone like you you've done your job because they like coming and staying so anyway so if you want more information about everything we've talked about um and again dr stacy has written some blog posts for us on sealants and and uh, I'd love it if you write more about anxiety, because um, I think, it, I mean, hopefully today we demonstrated how important that, that is. You can go to askthedentist.com. Also, if you're looking for a dentist like Dr. Stacy and you don't live in Portland, um, that's our, the whole point of our functional um, provider directory. And you can also find that on Ask the Dentist. I think that's askthedentist.com uh, slash directory. So make sure your dentist, your, your, sorry, your child sees the right dentist. That is so important. I, I hope we've made that very clear today because that first visit is everything. So again, thanks everyone for listening. And Dr. Stacy, again, thank you so much. It's always so much fun to talk with you. Thank you. Pleasure.